What have we done in the first three sections of the book? In the first section, we had a discussion of average rates of change. So we had a function. We had a function, some function, y equals f of x. And the average rate of change, the a rock, the average rate of change of y with respect to x or f with respect to x, I'll say f, the average rate of change of f with respect to x between two values of x. So between, I'll say, x equals a and x equals b. We define that to be the value of f at b minus the value of f at a divided by the change in x, so b minus a. Uh, of course, b and a need to be unequal to each other so that we're not dividing by zero. So of course, here we need b unequal to a, so b unequal to a. That's the average rate of change of, of a function with respect to a variable. And if, if this function is position and x strangely indicates the time, so we have the position as a function of time. One of our favorite examples of rates of change, this would be the change in position divided by the change in time. That's called the average velocity, the average rate of change of position with respect to time. We talked about that. And then the question was, how do we get the notion of an instantaneous rate of change of position with respect to time? So the instantaneous velocity, not between two times, but at an instant in time. What does the velocity at time A mean? Um, the thing that someone in a car reads off of the speedometer, if they take their direction into account. What, how do you get that? And what we, what we decided two sections ago in preludes to instantaneous rates of change, or the prelude to instantaneous rate of change, was you want the change in time to be small. So that if you take f, or the change in x, if you're talking about velocity, the change in time, if you're just talking about a general function, y in terms of x. Then what we looked at was, well, if we, want, if we want to know the instantaneous rate of change of f with respect to x, when x equals one particular value, a, what we should do is we, we put a into f. And then instead of b, we put in a plus h, where we think h should be really small. Um, and then you divide by the change in the x-coordinate, which is a plus h minus a. And we got that this was a plus h minus f of a over h. And what we'd like to do is look at this when h is very, very close to 0. Because if h is very close to 0, then this is measuring the change in your position divided by the change in time, at times very close to A. And that's what you need to do to get an instantaneous velocity or an approximation to it. Because if you take times that are far away from A, the velocity could have changed. So we looked at this and we said, ah, we need to take this as H gets arbitrarily close to zero. What do we mean? We mean you see if this gets close to something as h gets close to zero. And if it does, that thing should be the instantaneous rate of change of f with respect to x at x equals a. Or if this is position as a function of time, this would be the instantaneous velocity. So we have this notion of limit, the limit as h approaches zero of f of a plus h minus f of a over h. But this was imprecise because we, didn't, we hadn't defined what limit meant. But in the last section, we did define limit. We didn't prove many theorems about limits because really in this class we don't want to spend too much time proving theorems about limits. They're in the technical matters. The proofs are in the technical matters section at the end of the limits section. Some of them are in the midst of the limits section. But we will work with limits 
in kind of an intuitive way, I'll tell you which theorems we are using or tell you that it's fine and give you the reasons. But, but really what we mean by the limit is h approaches zero of f of a plus h minus f of a over h is you look at this quantity as h gets arbitrarily close to zero. And if this quantity approaches some number l, then we say the instantaneous rate of change exists and equals L. But we make up a notation for it. We don't just call it this kind of random letter L. So since, we've, since we made the notion of limit rigorous in the last section, now I can go ahead and kind of redefine what I defined earlier when we didn't have the notion of limit. So the definition. The instantaneous rate of change, the IROC, the instantaneous, instantaneous rate of change of F with respect to X. when x is some particular value a with respect to x, when x equals a is this limit, which is this limit, and we have a notation for it. You read this f prime of a, so you read this f prime of a. This IROC is also called the derivative of f at a. Provided the limit exists. Um, we say there's, there's a different verb form. We don't <coughs> say the function is derivable or something like that. We say differentiable. So assuming the limit exists, so if f prime of a exists, and by that I mean, i.e. the limit exists, That limit as h approaches zero, i.e., the limit exists. We say f is differentiable differentiable at a. Um, I should have said over here that um, at least one thing that needs to be true for this limit to exist, we need to be able for h to approach zero from either side. So through values slightly less than zero and through values slightly greater than zero. That means that we need f to be defined at, at points slightly bigger than a and slightly less than a, and we need it defined at a. So one important condition that I frequently will just implicitly assume, but I should say it at least once, to be differentiable at a, for this limit to exist, um, part of what you have to assume is that the domain of f contains an open interval around a. Um, if f prime of a, i.e. the limit. This should say this. We say that f is differentiable at a. In particular, this requires the domain of f. To contain 
an open interval around A. Um, a point, a point in the domain, a point in the domain such that an open interval around that point is also in the domain. This is called an interior point of the domain. We need A to be an interior point of the domain. This isn't enough. There are other things that have to be true. For the, limit to, uh, for the derivative to exist, that limit can fail to exist for other reasons other than not being at an interior point. I'll get to those at the end, I think. We need A to be an interior point of the domain. All right, uh, yeah, and we say that F is differentiable at A. Uh, we say differentiate f to produce the derivative. Um, yeah, differentiate is the verb form, for, the verb form for producing the derivative. This is this is the limit that defines the derivative at any at any x value a, but a could be anything, and so we can get a new function by defining it to be this limit. Right now it looks like it's a function of a, but really we're thinking of putting in a specific number for a. Uh, if we want to make it look more like a function, we would define a new function f prime of x by putting an x here and an x here and just letting x be anything. This is just called the derivative function, but nobody says that. The derivative means the derivative function. The, derive, the function derived from the original function, this, this function. Is the derivative of f. Its domain, I should say, its domain, the domain, so the derivative f prime of f, the domain of f prime well the domain is the set of x values that you can put in here and get something defined so it's the x's at which f is differentiable, the domain of f prime is those x values in the domain of f, at which f is differentiable. Uh, Yeah, we'll use the words derivative and differentiable often, but keep in mind, it's the instantaneous rate of change. This derivative function, it's a function that gives you the instantaneous rate of change of the original function f at any x value for which this limit exists. Um, I, haven't, I haven't finished with, with terminology and notation. Um, there are a few more pieces of notation that come up with derivatives and instantaneous rates of change. So suppose we have y equals f of x. So yes, there's the prime notation for the derivative. Fine, that's very common. Um, there's other notation um, developed by Leibniz. There's dy dx. You don't say dy divided by dx. You just don't. It's not a fraction. It's, it's a limit. It's a limit of fractions, but that doesn't make it a fraction. So you don't say dy divided by dx. You just say dy dx. Or you could say df dx. And, and write it like that. Um, there are other notations that you might see, um, but we're going to stick with these. 
These are the common ones. There's a notation with some dots. Uh, there's a notation with a capital D, but we're going to stick with these. Um, there is the question of how you indicate the derivative function at some value. So suppose you want to calculate the derivative when x is 5. In this notation, you would simply write f prime at 5. In this notation, in this notation, it's a little difficult to see where you would stick the 5. So what we do is put an evaluation line here and then write either x equals 5 or just write 5. So df dx evaluated. And you put a 5 there, and whoever is looking at this is supposed to know the independent variable is x. So this means x equals 5. So all of these mean the same thing. Um, some notation, different notations are convenient at different times. Um, certainly this notation is very nice, will be very nice when we get to something called the chain rule. It's, um, it also makes it explicit what you're differentiating with respect to, which is another nice feature of it. The fact that there's no place nice to put where you're evaluating it is probably its main deficiency. Um, okay, I would like to I would like to actually calculate derivatives of three specific functions just so we can have some to work with. Um, so we'll calculate some the derivatives of three very basic functions. <coughs> so, um, a theorem, or proposition, it's barely important enough to call a theorem. The, if you let, um, let's see, I'll make my notation match the book. W, so let W equal f of x equal just a constant. So it's a constant function. So for all values of x, f of x is just this constant c. And let y equals g of x be x. So this function is called the identity function. g of x is x. It gives you back whatever you put in it. And then we'll have a z, we'll let, and z equals m of x equals x squared. We'd like to know the derivatives of these three basic functions, constant types of basic functions. This is actually an infinite collection of functions, one for each different constant. We want to know derivatives of constants, derivative, the derivative of the identity function, and the derivative of the squaring function. So what are they? Uh, then, uh, I'll write <laughs> a couple of our notations. So um, dw dx, the derivative of w with respect to x, so the derivative of f with respect to x, or what's the same thing, f prime of x, is zero. This shouldn't be surprising. What's the instantaneous rate of change of a constant? It's constant. So it doesn't change. So what's its rate of change? Zero. Yeah, exactly. But we'll show that, even though it seems a little silly. Um, you could also write, oh, I'm just mixing up notations so you'll get used to it. You can also write y prime here equals dy dx equals g prime of x. All of these mean the same thing. Equals g prime of x. The derivative of x is just 1. And finally, we'll see that z prime, which is, I'll use one more notation, uh, dm dx equals, let me write another thing that we write. Well, maybe I'll skip that for a second. Um, equals m prime of x equals 2x. So the derivative of x squared, the squaring function, is 2x. All right, we'd like to see this. And how do you show these? You just have to go back to the limit definition and calculate them. So we do.
So, um, you know, the proof, although it's easy enough, it hardly, it almost doesn't deserve to be called a proof. So, what's, um, what is the derivative of f prime of x? Uh, sorry, what is the derivative of f of x? What is f prime of x? By definition, this is the limit as h approaches 0 of f of x plus h minus f of x over h. But f is the function that's always c. So this is c, this is c. So we get the limit as h approaches 0 of c minus c over h. This is the limit as h approaches 0 of 0. And that's just 0. Right? I mean, this, hopefully this sounds very reasonable. You might think, oh, but I really get 0 over 0 because this is 0, h is approaching 0. No, it's a limit. You look at this part and you think when h is unequal to 0, what, what is this? And you, when, the, when h is not 0, this is just 0 on the nose. And then the question is, as h gets arbitrarily close to 0, does 0 get arbitrarily close to anything? Yeah, of course it does. It doesn't just get close to it. It sits there being 0 the whole time. It's perfectly happy being 0. So, yeah, the derivative of a constant function is 0. What about g prime of x? g prime of x is the limit as h approaches 0 of g of x plus h minus g of x over h. But g is the identity function. It gives you back whatever you put into it. So g of x plus h is just x plus h. You subtract g of x, which is just x, and you divide by h. But the x's cancel, and you're left with the limit as h approaches 0 of h over h. But you do the algebra to eliminate the h's before you plug in h equals 0 into the resulting continuous function. And so this is the limit as h approaches 0, 1. And that's just 1. So yes, the derivative of the identity function is just 1. The derivative, we say the derivative of x is just 1. And finally, we have to find the derivative. We want to find the derivative of x squared. So you take m prime of x equals the limit as h approaches 0 of m of x plus h minus m of x all divided by h. Then you use that m is the squaring function. So m of x plus h means square the quantity x plus h. So you get x plus h quantity squared minus m of x. That's x squared all divided by h. We cannot plug in h equals 0. And maybe the algebra is not as obvious as it was before, but it's not too bad. You square this. So you get x squared plus the cross term 2xh plus h squared. You subtract x squared. You try to cancel this h in the denominator. And then when you end up with the continuous function, you plug in h equals 0. So we get the limit as h approaches 0 of x squared plus 2xh plus h squared minus x squared over h. But the x squareds cancel. Here's an x squared. Here's a minus x squared. Those cancel. Uh, 2xh. I said it. I wrote it wrong. Plus h squared minus x squared. The x squareds cancel. You can factor out an h from here and here and divide by this h. So what I'm saying is this is the limit as h approaches 0 of, this is h times 2x plus h divided by h. But now the h's cancel. And you're left with the limit as h approaches 0 of 2x plus h. But as h approaches 0, that just approaches 2x. So this is the limit as h approaches 0 of 2x plus h. But now this is a continuous function. You can plug in h equals 0 and just get 2x as we said we would. So that's how you show 
what those derivatives are. You just have to calculate from the definition. Later, in the next chapter, we'll accumulate a whole bunch of rules that will enable us, that we'll, we'll memorize the rules and we'll be able to calculate derivatives essentially as fast as we can write. Um, you just have to remember a relatively few number of rules, like maybe a dozen or a few general rules and then the derivatives of some specific functions like, well, x to any power. Um, yeah, but right now, I mean, somebody has to prove these rules. And right now we're seeing how you would prove rules for differentiation. We've just shown the derivative of x squared is 2x. So we'll, we won't ever calculate that again from the definition. We'll always just use that we just proved that the derivative of x squared is 2x. By the way, the way I'm saying that, the derivative of x squared equals 2x, that is how we talk. And it, there is a little notational confusion here that I should address this one time because um, everybody talks about it this way and really it's technically not right but it's it's very convenient and so we do it let me suppose you so we had m of x equals x squared and it's true then that m prime of x the derivative of m with respect to x is 2x this is true it's great but it gets kind of cumbersome to write, okay, call out this m of x and then write m prime of x. And what we like to write is just x squared with a prime symbol equals 2x. And I will start doing this, but technically this is bad. You may never have appreciated before, but the function here is m. And m of x, or x squared, actually is the function with the x value inserted into it. So x squared is some value of the squaring function when you've plugged, when you've put in something for x. Um, so this ought to mean a single value, and then you take its derivative. But that would mean this is a constant, and you take its derivative, and we know the derivative of a constant is 0. We just showed it. It's just understood that when you write x squared prime that you mean the, the function given by f of x equals x squared. And the reason you're supposed to know it's a function, not some particular value of a function with x put in it, is that x is one of our standard variable names and it looks like a function. We mean the function m of x, f of x, whatever you want to call it, whose value at x is x squared. The reason I'm saying that is, that, for instance, when I did the de definition of derivative, I said when x equals a. To make it clear, I was talking about plugging in a specific value for x. What if you want the derivative of the squaring function when x is 5? All right. Well, in this notation, the correct notation, you just put m prime of 5. Great. And so it's 2 times 5. Yes, it's 10. Or you can even use the notation with the, that looks like a fraction. dm dx evaluated when x equals 5. Yes, it's 2 times 5. It's 10. In this notation, what's the problem? If you just try to put in x equals 5 everywhere, you might write something horrible like 5 squared prime equals 2 times 5. This isn't what we mean by this line. Right? This, this would be 25. It's a constant. The derivative of a constant is 0. But, but that's what you get when you plug in x equals 5 up here. Yes, we don't really mean the value of the function with 5 stuck in it. This is supposed to represent the, f the squaring function, and you need to keep this straight. If you really wanted to write this, and then write that you were applying this formula at x equals 5, you would need to write something, and you didn't want to call the function anything, you would need to write some version of the, the vertical line and write when x is 5 and then write 2 times 5 and equals 10. And this is why we switch to, to a sometimes. Because when we write a squared, it sounds like we've plugged in something for x. a isn't one of our standard variable names. We use it a lot for constants. And so we say, oh, when x is some particular value a, um, this is true. That's because when we write a squared, we think of it as, oh yeah, that's the squaring function, but you put in something for a. So we mean, you think of it 
as the value of the squaring function at a particular value. So it's just a number. You don't think of it as a function. You think of it as a number. Whereas if we write x squared, you, know, you don't think, oh, they, they're mean, they mean they pick something for x and that's one value. No, we mean the function squaring. All right, I think I've beaten that enough. You know, I've, I've, but that point, but it's a, it's a confusing point if you don't address it at least once. So try to keep that straight. Um, we looked at secant lines and mentioned tangent lines um, in the last section. And now that we actually have a rigorous notion of, of derivative, so one where in terms of limits, and we know what limits mean from the last section, now we can define the tangent line at a point where the function is differentiable. <coughs> so suppose f is differentiable at a. So I remind you, that means that the derivative exists when x is a, is differentiable at a. Then, this is a definition, then the tangent line to the graph of f at, well, it would be at the point where x is a and the y value would be f of a, so at a, f of a, is the line given by, well, we'll give an equation that describes it. We'll use the point-slope form. Is the line given by y minus f of a equals f prime of a times x minus a? Uh, what? The, this is a point on the graph, a f of a. So now we're thinking of putting in a particular value for x. So we've got a and f of a. We talked about this um, two sections ago. We looked at this two sections ago. f prime of a, this instantaneous rate of change of f when x equals a, that's the slope of the tangent line. So this is the slope of the tangent line. And graphically, at most points, what you expect to see, see is this line just glance off of the graph. It's a limit of secant lines. Um, this is the slope of the tangent line. A lot of people would just call this the slope of f. I don't say that terribly often, but some people do. So slope of the tangent line, the slope of f. I said the tangent line to the graph of f, but some people would just say the tangent line of f. Um, there are a lot of ways to say this. This is the longest one. But, um, and it means, for instance, for a parabola. Right, here's, here's the graph of y equals, I guess we called it z before, but now maybe I'll switch to y and x. So here's the graph of y equals x squared. Yeah, we said z equals x squared when I was writing the theorem, but y and x are our favorite variable names. Here's the graph of y equals x squared, a tangent line to it at a point. So you move to some point on the graph, so you take some x-coordinate, like a, you move to the corresponding point on the graph, and the tangent line is this line that just glances off of the graph at the point a, f of a. Um, that's the tangent line, and this gives you a formula for it at every x value. You have to be careful here. You really do need to pick a new name for the x coordinate you're looking at when you write an equation for the tangent line because you want to use, you want to use x and y to describe points on the line. Well, then you better not be using x and y to mean the particular place where you're calculating the tangent line, so you need to pick a new something you're thinking of is a fixed x value. So I called it a. That's one of our favorite names for a fixed x value. So for instance, what, what's an equation for the tangent line to the graph of y equals x squared when x equals 5? So find 
an equation. for the tangent line. To the graph of y equals x squared when x equals 5. I, even now I've changed my phrasing because I didn't say when x is 5 and y is 25, I just gave the x-coordinate and let you figure out the y-coordinate. So what's an equation for this? Well, we know the derivative of x squared. We know that y prime is 2x. And so um, y prime, when x is 5, one way to write that would be this, is 10. And so that formula for the tangent line is y minus the y-coordinate on the graph, which is 25, equals the slope times x minus the x-coordinate. We're using the point-slope form for a line. This is the one that's most convenient when you're finding equations for tangent lines because the derivative gives you the slope, and you've got a point already where you know you're finding the tangent line. So you know, this is just the nicest form. Yes, you can put it in slope-intercept form, which people love so much, you can write this as y minus 25 equals 10x minus 50, and then add 25 to both sides and get y equals 10x minus 25. But unless you're asked to do that, if you're just asked for an equation for the tangent line, um, I'd leave it like this. If you're asked to write it in slope-intercept form or write it in the y equals some function of x, then yeah, you should. You should Write it like that instead. OK, um, what else do we want to do with this? Well, why don't we come back to kind of our motivating, our fundamental motivating uh, physical, physical problem that motivated the whole instantaneous rate of change discussion for us. We're given the position of something as a function of time, and we'd like to know what the instantaneous velocity is. So why don't we do that? So. So, um, example, suppose a particle is moving along the, suppose a particle is moving along the x-axis. That's just a convenient way of saying we've set up some axis. You know, it's moving in a straight line and we set up an x-axis along its path. But it's easiest just to say it's moving along the x-axis. Suppose a particle is moving along the x-axis so that its position x equals x of t in, I suppose, in meters. at time t seconds. Uh, for t greater than or equal to 0 is, let's say it's the square root of t, which is why I made sure I said that let's assume t is greater than or equal to 0. So we've just started our stopwatch someplace, and we're talking about what's happening from that time on. So we're just looking at, we called when I, we started our stopwatch time zero. And yeah, from then on, the particle's x-coordinate is the square root of t. What's the, what is the velocity of the particle as a function of time? Um, what is the velocity? Let's call it v. 
v, and I want it as a function of time. So at any time t, but it will need to be defined, and we'll see what that means. And the second one is the velocity, v equals v of t over the particle. What's the velocity at time 4? Four seconds. All right. What do you do? <laughs> you have to calculate a limit. Uh, I'll say it again. Later, we'll have some rules, and we'd be able to calculate this as fast as we can write. I mean, it would take us uh, a, a second, maybe two seconds, to write the answer. But that's because someone else will have done, well, we'll have done it at that time, but um, we'll have done the general algebra that would, that, and come up with a rule that we can remember for how to calculate this. But right now, we have to do it barehandedly. You take x, which is a function of t, given by the square root of t, and we need to calculate x prime of t. Right? The instantaneous rate of change of the position with respect to time. That is the velocity. And so it's the limit as h approaches 0 of x of t plus h minus x at t all over h. What's the domain of this going to be? Well, we immediately have to leave out at least one time. I remind you that... Um, a function is not differentiable. Well, it, to be differentiable, you at least have to have an open interval around, to be differentiable at some t value, you have to have an open interval around that t value that's in the domain of the function. Here, for t greater than or equal to zero, um, we don't have an open interval around zero that's contained in the domain of this function because this isn't defined when t is negative. So we can only calculate the velocity. We take this limit for t strictly greater than 0. So we don't do it at time 0. But this will be for t greater than 0. We might, it's possible that this limit will fail to exist at other points also, but for other reasons. But right now we know at most we can get for t greater than 0. And now you need to calculate. So what do you get? You get the limit as h approaches 0 of, we're using the square root function. So the square, this is the square root of the quantity t plus h minus the square root of t divided by h. And what our goal is, as we discussed last, in the last section, we need to do some algebra to this to eliminate this division by h and come up with an elementary function. Some function that's, well, some combination of the functions that we're used to. That's, pretty, that's all that an elementary function means. But one that's defined when we plug in h equals 0. When we substitute 0 for h, we need to get something that's defined right now, if, as always in derivatives. If you simply stick in h is 0 there and there, you get 0 over 0. That's always the case. The whole goal in doing these limits is to produce something meaningful. Really, our method, this isn't always true, but almost always. You do some algebra to this to eliminate the division by h. You end up with a continuous function, and then you just can plug in h equals 0 to get the value of the limit because the function's continuous. What algebra do we do here? Uh, you just have to think. And how do you know which algebra to do? You don't really ahead of time, except with a lot of practice, but, but you try to think of every piece of algebra you've ever seen, and one that will help you here somehow divide away this h and get rid of the problem. So if you think about this long enough, maybe you would come up with, maybe you wouldn't, but maybe you'd come up with, you multiply by what's called the conjugate of the numerator. So we have something minus uh, something, so instead, you multiply by that square root of t plus h plus the square root of t. 
but you can't change what you had. I mean, even if you know, even if you decide you want to do that in the numerator, well, then you have to do it in the denominator, not to change the fraction. You might think, well, how about if I square the numerator and denominator? First of all, that would give you a cross term that was bad in the numerator. Secondly, when you square a fraction, you change it. We multiplied the numerator and denominator by the same thing, so we didn't change the fraction. I usually refer to this as mathematician stupid trick number two. Mathematician stupid trick number two. Multiply by one in a clever way. So that's multiplying by one in a clever way. Um, mathematician stupid trick number one is to add zero in a clever way. Um, okay, how does that help us? Well, you, you should remember the, how the difference of squares factors. This is the factorization for the difference of squares. Something minus something times something plus something. But we're going to unfactor it. That means that this is the first quantity squared minus the second quantity squared. And that will get rid of the square roots in a nice way for us. I'll say it again. How would you think of this? You just try to think of all the algebra you've ever seen. There's no recipe that will tell you how to do every single limit problem. You just have to do, oh, you just have to think of the right thing. But, of course, with practice, you do understand more, of, or you can see these faster as time goes on. So, you multiply those two numerators together. You get, or, sorry, you multiply those two factors in the numerator together. You get the first quantity squared minus the second quantity squared, all divided by h times, and nothing happens in the denominator. It sits there being the ugly thing that it is. So you get this. But the nice thing in the numerator is you just squared those square roots. And so you get the limit as h approaches 0 of t plus h minus t over h times the square root of t plus h plus the square root of t. The t's cancel. This t cancels with this minus t. You're left with an h up there. But then that cancels with this h. And you are left with the limit as h approaches 0 of 1 over the square root of t plus h plus the square root of t. But now we've gotten rid of the division by h. And when you plug in h equals 0, because this is a continuous function, you get something that's defined. You get 1 over the square root of t plus the square root of t. In other words, you get 1 over 2 times the square root of t. This is the velocity function. So what we've just found is our velocity as a function of time so, is 1 over 2 times the square root of t. And yeah, we, we, we said ahead of time that we were only going to do this for t greater than 0, which is good because even if we hadn't said that, we would have noticed now, oh, if t is 0, this is undefined. But it's defined every place else. So this is for t greater than 0. Right. And that's what you get. And what's the velocity at time, at time 4? Well, you just plug in 4. v at time 4. 1 over 2 times the square root of 4. The square root of 4 is 2. 1 fourth. I have very badly dropped my units. Uh, we were in the units on the derivative. The, the units on the derivative, always the units of the function divided by the units of the variable. So it's meters per second. And I shouldn't leave those out. I, I didn't want to write them during the long calculation, but at the end, you should certainly write them. Uh, it's this many meters per second um, for t greater than 0. And I may have said it before, but I'll say it again. My s's, my printed s's tend to look like fives. So when I need to write s's and don't want them to look like fives, I use my cursive s, which may not look that much like an s to you, but at least it shouldn't look like a five. So. Um, this is how you calculate. But of course, we'd like to have rules to help us calculate faster. Um, one of the things that would help us calculate faster are rules like we already have three that seem kind of silly. We, I mean, 
are basic. Maybe not silly. We have the derivative of a constant, 0. The derivative of just x is 1. And the derivative of x squared is 2x. Um, I'd like to derive a couple of more. And then I need to say how derivatives can fail to exist quickly. And then we'll stop. Maybe before I derive a couple more, I, I should have said something about <laughs> the graphs of constant functions and the identity function. So if you have y equals a constant, so y equals a constant, the graph of that is just some horizontal line at the y value c. Great. The, the derivative is 0. That's the slope of the tangent line. What is an equation for the tangent line at, at any point? Well, you're at this point. We said the tangent line glances off of the graph. Well, I mean, that's how you normally think of it. But in this case, it won't glance off the graph. It'll actually be the same as the graph because you're supposed to, you're supposed to draw a line through that point. So if you want the tangent line at this point, the, it would be a line of slope 0 passing through that point. Well, that's this line. So yeah, while our kind of intuitive notion of a tangent line is that it glances off the graph, you know, we, we have a definition, and it involves the derivative. But it's also supposed to be the, the limit of secant lines. And of course, every secant line here, the line connecting any two points on this graph, is just this line. So it should hardly be surprising that the tangent line comes out to be this line, even if it doesn't quite agree with our intuitive idea of glancing off of the graph. Um, the same thing happens here for y equals x. If you take y equals x, that's just this straight line. And this kind of thing will happen for any line. What's, you know, if you're at this point, here's a point on the line. What's the tangent line at that point? Well, because, because all the secant lines would be this line. All the, you know, the tangent lines are all just going to be this line. But rigorously, if you really want to go back, you know, use our definition, you go to a point on the graph, and then you need to draw a line with slope 1. So a line with slope 1 through a point on this, well, that's this line again. So tangent lines <laughs> to lines are actually kind of stupid, but, or silly, or obvious. Um, but you should keep in mind that just because we kind of Imagine most tangent lines glancing off a graph. They don't have to glance off. They can do something like this. All right. Let's, um, let me derive a couple of interesting basic differentiation rules for us that we'll use throughout the rest of the book. And then quickly say something about how a function can fail to be differentiable in various ways. So. Um, I would like to see that the derivative of a constant times a function, actually, I'll write it like this. We would like to see that the derivative of a constant times a function is just the constant times the derivative of the function. We say you can pull constants out of derivatives. And I'd also like to see that the derivative of the sum of two functions is the sum of the derivatives. So we typically say something like, you can split up sums and pull out constants. Why are these things true? Well, these are both easy. Uh, the proofs are in the section. Let me, let me just do one of them, for instance. Let's, let's, why is this one true? So you, you'd like to know what's the derivative of a constant times x. Well, it should be the limit as, as h approaches 0 of c times f of x plus h, c times f of x plus h, minus c times f of x, all over h. But you can factor the c out. So this is the same as the limit as h approaches 0 of c times f of x plus h minus f of x over h. 
But this is the limit of a constant time something. And one of the limit results says, oh, you can pull that constant out and say that this limit is a constant times the other limit, providing that the limit in the end exists. So what we get is, this is c times the limit as h approaches 0 of f of x plus h minus f of x over h. But this is just f prime of x. It's the derivative, the definition of the derivative. So what does this say? It says if f is differentiable at x, then c times f is differentiable at x. And the derivative of c times this is c times this derivative. You can pull out constants. The summation formula is equally easy. Um, you just write the limit definition and split up the sums, and you get a sum of two limits. You need to know that both of the limits in the end exist. You need to know, know that both the real statement of the theorem in the book says if f is differentiable at x and g is differentiable at x, then f plus g is differentiable at x, and the derivative of f plus g is the sum of those derivatives. So you have to know the, the little pieces exist first. Um, and you have to know like f prime of x exists here to conclude this exists. But. All right. Um, so those are two, two formulas that we're going to use later. And just as quick practice with them, it tells you, combined with these three, how to differentiate quadratic polynomials. So for instance, what's the derivative of 5x squared minus 3x plus 7? Well, our summation formula tells us we can split this up as a sum. It's the derivative of 5x squared. I'm, I'll write minus 3x is plus negative 3x. So we're using the sum, the summation formula twice, plus the derivative of 7. But then you can pull constants out of derivatives. We use that the derivative of a constant times something is the constant times the derivative. Same thing here. You pull out the constant. And the derivative of a constant is 0. So this part is just 0. And then you plug in that the derivative of x is 1. And the derivative of x squared is 2x, because we know those things. And so we get 5 times 2x minus 3 times 1. So we get 10x minus 3 for the derivative. We don't have to calculate using the limit, because we're we already developed these rules using the limit definition. Um, we develop these rules using the limit definition, and we combine them and quickly take the derivative of something more complicated. We're after a lot more rules so that we can calculate all these derivatives quickly. I should also point out here I wrote, I, we had minus 3x. I wrote it as plus negative and then pulled out the negative number. And in the end, what you see is that subtraction, you can also split up subtraction. So if it looks significantly different to you, um, you can write this summation thing as plus or minus and a plus or minus over here. That if you have the derivative of a difference of things, it's the difference of the derivatives. All right. Um, before, before we leave this section, um, we will do more applications when we have more rules, more to work with. But before we leave this section, I should tell you ways that the derivative can fail to exist quickly. Um, one is the function can be discontinuous at a point. That'll stop the derivative from existing. If I had longer, I'd talk about this. But the, the main thrust of this course is not to study functions that are not differentiable. It's to study functions that are, so functions whose derivative always exists. So, but one way, like our lobster function, except I'm not going to draw something that complicated. But if a, if a function is not continuous, so this is the graph of y equals f of x, and this is just pick some number. Maybe this is at x equals 5. Then f is not differentiable at 5.
Why not? Well, intuitively, it's because the change in f is big, even though the change in x can get arbitrarily small, which means that you get some kind of infinite limit. But there's actually a theorem. Um, it's in the book, theorem. If f is not continuous, at x equals a, like this one's not continuous at 5, then f is not differentiable at a. So a minimal thing that has to be true is that the function has to be continuous there. Well, you also need an open interval around um, a to be in the domain of the function. But even if the function's continuous, and even if there's an open interval around the x value, the derivative can fail to exist in at least, well, two other ways. One is that the graph can have a sharp point in it. So here's the graph, roughly, of absolute value. y equals the absolute value of x. What you see is that from the, le uh, from the right, you have the line. This is part of the line. This is part of y equals x. This part of the graph, that is part of the line y equals minus x. The slope over here is 1. The slope over here is minus 1. So intuitively, there is no tangent line here with some given slope. You might think, ah, average the 1 and the minus 1 and get 0. No. It's the slope looks like one thing from one side and something else from the other side. We, there just is no tangent line here. It's not differentiable. That limit doesn't exist. Limits can't be two different values. So this is what you frequently see in graphs that indicate that a function is not differentiable, if it's continuous. You see a sharp point. There's one other way this can happen. Um, well, depends on how you count, how many ways there are. But you could take a graph. Let me try to draw this, kind of exaggerate what's happening. So I'm, I'm attempting to draw the graph of y equals x to the 1 third, so the cube root of x. Its graph looks roughly like that. And if I've drawn it close to correctly, what you might be able to see is that what you'd like to call a tangent line, if you take the slopes of the secant line, or if you take the tangent lines, see what they approach, when they get to zero, the tangent lines are vert. What you'd like to call a tangent line is vertical. It also doesn't glance off the graph, it cuts right through it, but then it would, the tangent line would continue nicely glancing off the graph. If there really is a vertical tangent line here, its slope would be infinite. And its slope is the derivative, and so its derivative would be infinite, and the derivative wouldn't exist. Is that what's happening? Yes, that is what's happening. Because we can calculate this, that this is not differentiable at 0. So let's, this will be the last thing we do today. Um, so let's let f of x equal the x to the 1 third power, the cube root of x. I claim this is not differentiable at 0. So let's look at f prime at 0. By definition, this is the limit as h approaches 0 of f of, normally we have x plus h, but we're putting in the particular x value 0. So 0 plus h minus f of x, but we're doing this when x is 0, minus f of 0 over h. What does that give you? It gives you the limit as h approaches 0 of f of h is h to the 1 third, h to the 1 third power, minus f at 0. That's 0, all divided by h. This is h to the minus 2 thirds power, or what's the same thing? 1 over h to the 2 thirds. One.
what happens? As h approaches zero, this is, this is, you take the cube root of h and you square it. So whether h approaches zero from the left or from the right, so through numbers smaller than zero or greater than zero, the cube root exists and is very close to zero, and then you square it. So you get something very close to zero and positive because you're squaring. So you get something very close to zero but positive, and as h gets closer and closer to zero, this gets closer and closer to zero, but through positive numbers. One over something very close to zero, very large, assuming it's something close to zero and positive, very big, and it gets bigger and bigger, we say that this approaches infinity, which is what we wanted to see, that the, the slope of the tangent line is infinite. Yes, we usually say that this graph does have a vertical tangent line, with an, so it has an infinite slope, but that doesn't mean the derivative exists. Infinity doesn't exist, um, but this is failing, <laughs> it says that the derivative fails to exist in a particularly describable way that actually has some nice implications, like there's a tangent line, it just happens to be vertical. All right, next time, well, in the next section, uh, it'll be, we should be very brief. It's on taking derivatives of derivatives. And after that, we're going to develop all these rules for calculating derivatives, and we'll be able to do many more interesting physics and, and population and, and engineering problems once we have some good formulas to work with. So that's what we'll do in the next few sections.